Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on GNSS and 5G positioning. This event is brought to you by European Space Agency and GMV. My name is Florin Gregg. I work as a GNSS navigation engineer at ESA, and I will be one of your hosts uh, for today. We have a busy morning ahead of us. And the event of today is organized in two main sessions. In the first session, we will be looking at field measurement uh, results and simulation results involving GNSS and uh, 5G. While for the second session of this morning, we will looking into the future. We will look at uh, PNT 2030 and we will discuss uh, more about um, networks of 2030 and as you can see from the agenda we will have representatives from the industry from the research and academia and also from space before moving further i would like to spare just uh, one minute to build common grounds with you the audience uh, regarding 5g so in response to the society demands uh, 5G is more than just uh, mobile broadband at higher data rates. Mobile broadband, of course, will continue to be one of the important scenarios to be addressed by 5G, but there's two additional uh, scenarios that involve a lot of use cases. For instance, the massive machine type communication. So here you can think about um, IoT, you can think about smart cities, and another scenario very important is the ultra reliable and low latency communications you can think here about smart manufacturing or about um, connected vehicles for 5g positioning is an integral part of the system design and is expected actually to enable many of the use cases in the ultra reliable uh, and low latency communication scenario as well in the MMTC scenario. The radio for 5G includes uh, wide bandwidth, includes new new spectrum uh, in the <clears throat> sorry in the millimeter wave, and this enables um, highly accurate direction and time of arrival estimation. Well, besides these features. 5G supports also ultra dense deployment and integration of GNSS. And actually, it builds and it makes 5G as, a, as an ecosystem for positioning services targeting below one meter accuracy. And these are very important elements that uh, we consider at ESA back in, uh, in 2017 when we decided to begin working on 5G and GNSS positioning. One of our flagship projects is the GINTO 5G, the GNSS into 5G project uh, launched in mid 2018 and funded by the European GNSS Evolution Program. And actually the first session of today is entirely dedicated to, to, the, to show the results and the achievements of uh, GINTO 5G project. This project is implemented by a team led by GMV and includes uh, the German Space Agency, University Autonome of Barcelona, Telefonica, Fraunhofer, and New Blocks. Besides this, we were also very fortunate to, to be able to collaborate with Novatel, Deutsche Telekom, Rode Schwarz, and ZTE. And later in the, um, in, in the morning, you will hear uh, from some of them as well. More about this project could be read uh, at the following website. Uh, you will have included in the material that we will distribute at the end of the event. Besides the um, GINTO 5G project, recently as part of the NAVISP Element 2 general call for ideas, we launched a dedicated uh, window to, for the PNT for 5G and seeking co-funding projects to demonstrate the potential of 5G as a positioning technology in use cases such as uh, industrial automation, so indoor critical applications, but also time and frequency synchronization. The call um, has been closed at the end of February, 
but I've been told by the novice management that proposals can still be submitted in the frame of the general element to open call. More about this can be can be seen on the novice website and on the ESA YouTube channel where there's a recording uh, about the entire event. Before starting the first session, I would like just to take one more minute of your time to introduce uh, Francisco Jose Mataroco. He is going to moderate the first session and he is the project uh, manager of Ginto 5G. Francisco works at GMV since uh, 2018 and he works on GNSS and as a project manager in Ginto 5G of of course, it's one of the important projects he participated to next to the Positrino Novice activity. Welcome, Francisco. Thank you for, for joining. And you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for him. I'm going to start sharing my slides. Okay, so what we're going to see here is a small summary of the work done in Ginto 5G project. The Ginto 5G project has three well differentiated objectives. The first one is to evaluate the potential of hybrid positioning based on GNSS and 5G using field measurements. The second one is to develop a system level simulator for 5G and GNSS positioning. And the third one is to support ESA and its participation to 3GPP standardization activities. As you can see by the arrows under the first and second objectives, we have two specific talks to explain the period of work done in these areas. And hence my presentation will be focused on the experimental campaign. We have been involved in two different experimental campaigns. A first one with GNSS and LTE and a second one with GNSS and 5G. We defined four different areas in order to characterize typical environments for each use case. These areas are open sky or rural area, which would correspond to the upper picture in the slide. Suburban or outskirts area corresponding to the second picture in the slide. Euro canyons or deep urban areas corresponding to the remaining picture at the bottom of the slide and the transition between areas. You can see also by the name of the experimental campaigns that we divided the GNSS and LTE campaign into three for the land vehicle use case, the UAV use case, and the IoT pedestrian use case. We have installed a wide range of receivers, IMUs, and correction services from IoT and low end to high end equipment. As a more visual experience, we have in this slide some pictures of the platforms used for carrying out these experiments. The first one with the two vehicles correspond to the GNSS and LTE land vehicle experiments carried out in Munich. Just below this picture, you can see the drone used during the GNSS and LTE experimental campaign, carried out also in Munich for the UAV's use case. At the bottom right side of the slide is presented a picture of the IoT box built for the IoT experimental campaign carried out in Madrid. And then the two remaining pictures correspond to the GNSS 5G experiments carried out in Nuremberg. With this wide range of devices, receivers and scenarios, we intended to characterize the behavior of each system in each environment, having this way a powerful and a structured input to introduce into the system level simulator for 5G GNSS. In this slide are presented all the connection diagrams and devices used for the different campaigns. We thought that showing the, all these diagrams together could help to understand the large amount of equipment and devices used in the experimental campaign for this project. We have the two vehicles, one as a rover, another as a base in the land vehicles campaign, since we also tested moving base RTK. Then we have all the connections for the UAV use case and also the IoT case at the bottom left side of the slide. And finally, the two platforms with the connections for the GNSS 5G FR1 hybrid and the 5G FR2 experimental campaigns. 
After all the experimental campaigns, all the results were analyzed, filtered, and introduced in the 5D GNSS positioning simulator developed in the project and called PopCut, and as indicated under the arrow, is by positioning, performance, and coverage tool. This enables the simulator to work with a multiple combination of devices, different grades, standalone, and combined. It also leaves the door open for the integration of additional data from future experimental campaigns. Now, Maximilian Kasparek will present a deeper view of the work done for the first object of this project. He works as a project manager and researcher at the Fraunhofer Institute for Integrated Circuits in Nuremberg. His current research is focused on the industrial application of mobile radio communications and precise positioning. Okay, Max, I give you the floor. So far, I cannot share, I think. Ah, okay. I hope you can see my slides now. Yes, we can. Yes, welcome. Okay, then thank you for the introduction. Good morning from Nuremberg, where in theory you're now again allowed to get a haircut, but as you can see in practice, this can still be difficult. Um, now, our part of the project was the hybrid positioning approach for 5G and GNSS at a campus environment. And um, just for the outline, what you can see in this panorama picture here is our test center in Nuremberg that was created especially to evaluate positioning for industrial applications. And um, yeah, we tried our uh, field campaign for, for a hybrid approach where we used multiband GNSS and emulated 5G new radio downlink TDOA. And our approach for this hybrid positioning was not uh, fusing pre-calculated positions, but um, fusing the data on TOA level, so a little bit more low level. Um, for a start, to give you an idea what we did, this is the um, setup that we used. On the left, you can see that we had a mobile unit consisting of a GNSS receiver, obviously used to, to capture satellite signals, and um, USRP that was used to, to capture the 5G new radio downlink positioning signals. Um, the mobile unit also had a storage, so um, this was no online processing. Data was recorded and then um, processed afterwards. On the right side, you can see our uh, 5G new radio infrastructure that consists of multiple distributed USRPs. I think during the test, it have been 11 USRPs that were used as transmission uh, reception points and they are connected to a cluster with servers and a common synchronization source. Um, obviously, this is no commercial 5G equipment, <clears throat> but it's sufficient to um, transmit the relevant um, 5G signals um, for positioning. Now, here is a bird's view of our test center. These funny colored dots, they mark the antenna positions of our deployment. So the, the blue dots uh, represent the antennas we have installed indoor, and the or orange dots are the locations of the outdoor TRPs or outdoor TRP antennas. In total, we covered three areas during our field campaign. The first area was, sorry, the first area was the indoor area. Obviously, we could do, just do uh, 5G new radio FR1 measurements here because it's a GNSS denied area. The second area was the loading zone. So this is covered by the outdoor TRPs. And in the south here in the shadows, you can see uh, what we call the driveway. In the beginning, we thought it would be nice to not have these well covered areas and also do some kind of evaluation about non-line of sight effects. Um, yeah, what we what we started calling non-line of sight um, driveway uh, turned out to be the non-line of sight hell in the end, but nevertheless, some, some interesting results that we get there, even uh, if they are not pretty good. Um, 
one word about the spectrum that we used. Um, we used 3.7 to 3.8 gigahertz, um, the full 100 megahertz of bandwidth that you can use in 5G with frequency range one. And what you perhaps don't know, um, this spectrum is in Germany reserved for local private 5G networks, for example, for industrial applications. So what we do here is something that uh, people have in mind to, to, uh, to operate at uh, industrial campuses in the future. Um, and we're pretty, I think we're pretty near to a realistic campus scenario here. For GNSS, we used uh, GPS, Galileo and GLONASS. And now I would like to go to uh, the results focusing on the uh, loading zone measurements because the loading zone allowed us hybrid positioning. Obviously, it's a clear sky and um, has also 5G coverage. And in, in, in fact, it forms that what uh, the 3GPP calls an enhanced positioning service area. So these five TRPs um, have a, a, with a high line of sight probability, they should in theory allow positioning. And um, if you look on the right side, then you can see um, three trajectories. In green, that's the reference. We measured with a reference measurement system. Um, and in black, the actual 5G measurement. So this is for the moment just about 5G new radio um, positioning here. And as you can see, the measurements aren't um, looking looking very very nice and smooth. Um, but it's a very basic positioning approach because we wanted to evaluate also what's happening with TOA. So this is no sophisticated Kalman filtered positioning. It's just snapshot based one transmission after the other, no filtering applied. And if you look at the filtered, um, filtered position, that's what you can expect if you, if you take a little bit more sophisticated positioning algorithm in the end, although this filter was deploy, uh, applied afterwards, you can see that this blue trajectory, uh, in fact, doesn't look that bad. It's not as nice as the reference, uh, but most of the time it's good. But obviously down here, we're having um, some, some issues um, that can be explained because um, we don't have that much redundancy. So we need at least five um, transmitters for our TDOA processing. And um, yeah, we have exactly five line of sight transmitters here. And if you have measurement errors on one that um, are a little bit bigger than you will get um, issues with the positioning result. So if you look at the table on the left side, you can see 2D position, 50% uh, and 95% uh, um, is, is between one and two meters and also filtered in uh, blue or unfiltered in black. That doesn't really make a, a huge difference here. And um, spherical error probable, um, the 3D error, that, that, that's really bad. Um, but also the, the 2D error of one meter is not what you ex would expect with 100 megahertz of bandwidth in a well-synchronized system. So um, what's the reason for that? Um, we have a pretty good excuse. Um, Corona, um, not because we were not able to do our jobs, but we had uh, antenna deployment that we had to do ourselves. And what you see here is the delusion of precision analysis um, for these five nine, uh, line of sight outdoor antennas. Um, and as you can see, we have um, error factors. So if you, if you don't know it, um, illusion of precision, the, the uh, result tells you um, what a TOA measurement error translates to a positioning error. And this is just a factor. And as you can see, um, where our tra trajectory lies in, 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 in this case I just showed you, um, that's really horrible. So a um, measurement error for the TOA of uh, one meter will translate to multiple meters here. And um, yeah, that's so obviously um, we would get better positioning results if we had a more optimized antenna deployment. What you can also see if you take a look at the um, TOA errors. So here we can identify, I think, about three clusters. First of all, we have these line of sight TRPs and they result in uh, very accurate um, TOA measurements. So 
This is um, about 50% significantly below one meter. And uh, yeah, the majority stays below one meter. But there's also um, some TRPs where we have short indirections and where, where the majority of measurements results in about one meter of error and up to multiple meters here. And um, then we also have indoor TRPs that are directed away from the loading zone. The signals will reach eventually the loading zone, but just after multiple reflections. Um, and um, yeah, the TOA error here is um, is significant. So um, how, how to deal with that heterogeneity, um, especially if you move from one area to the other where the quality of the cert uh, certain TRPs uh, will significantly change. So if you look at indoor, all these outdoor TRPs would have a significantly high error and the high error TRPs would show low error. So we can think about two possible solutions. The first one would be distinguishing line of sight and non-line of sight measurements. Um, but that's not that easy. You cannot simply use something like the SNR. We tried that, but even um, a high timing error measurement can still be a uh, nice signal with low error and no interference and will result in a nice uh, in a high SNR. Another approach that some of my colleagues are working currently on is exploiting non-line of sight information for the positioning. Um, but in both cases, I think further research will be required. And um, everything we did with high and precise positioning um, so far uh, relied often on over-determinacy. So we, we had a high number of low error um, TOA measurements and then it's much easier to filter out the errors. But if the errors are in the majority, then it becomes complex. So this was for FR1. What happens if we put it together with GNSS? And the good news is the approach works in general. So if you fuse pseudo ranges, um, then you can you can do positioning but if you look at the trajectories on the right side we have in black the reference in green 5g new radio and gnss and hybrid are very similar <clears throat> in red and blue so uh, what's the challenge here <laughs> first of all we have a very low number of 5G new radio TRPs compared to the number of um, GNSS satellites. So that's an issue. And um, what you can do here is weighting. So if we, if we increase the weight of the 5G um, TOAs for the positioning, then you can see that the hybrid trajectory is getting better and it's becoming similar to the 5G new radio trajectory. But um, just increasing the weight is not a straightforward approach because I told you there was this driveway where we had real um, non-line of sight issues. And um, in fact, GNSS was significantly better than 5G in that driveway um, area. So we have GNSS denied and 5G denied areas. And um, what we in fact need is an approach that dynamically weights GNSS and 5G in this case, um, or at least is location aware. So this is something that we are still working on. Um, I'm not. Sh I'm pretty sure we won't find an optimal solution in that case. So what we are currently looking on um, during the last weeks of the project is the statistical distribution and statistics of contribution for certain satellites, for certain TRPs. This is perhaps um, just a little bit uh, more different. Um, the CDF of the error for in yellow 5G FR1, in blue GNSS, and in red um, the hybrid approach. And as you can see from this trajectories, I wouldn't say that um, yeah, GNSS benefits from um, bringing together with 5G, but here you can see that there are in fact um, certain measurements where the um, GNS, uh, where the uh, 5G FR1 TOAs um, clearly result in a, in a better result, uh, clearly result in a lower error than the, the hybrid measurement. And um, by increasing the weight and finding a 
yeah, intelligent way to, to dynamically uh, weight the TOAs. Um, it would be um, our goal would be to 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 get this hybrid curve far more to the left near the 5G um, FR1 and for other measurements where GNSS is better. Um, um, yeah, benefit from the higher GNSS accuracy at the same time. So before I end, I presented uh, results for the loading zone because that's an enhanced positioning service area. We have GNSS coverage, we have 5G new radio coverage, but we also did measurements indoor. And um, the setup we used in that project is also used in other projects. And I just want to give you an impression of we, uh, what, we, what we did indoor. This is, in fact, the same system. It's downlink TDOA. Um, we have our mobile unit, which is a AGV in this case. And um, we have six transmit antennas that are um, transmitting the um, 5G downlink positioning sequences. Um, the, dif the difference is we have real-time processing here. So this is a screen capture um, from a dashboard. Um, and in this case, the antenna deployment is still not perfect because all antennas are on one height, but um, significantly better than what we could achieve outdoor. And um, if you look at the position uh, down here, that's just X and Y component of the position. If you evaluate that and compare it with a reference measurement, you can see that um, in a scenario where you're in the center of your area, you have um, distributed the antennas all around you. Um, dilution of precision is, is more beneficial and it's pretty easy to get below 50 centimeters of accuracy. Even so, you don't use any filtering um, neither in the positioning um, calculation nor um, in the in the post processing. Yeah, on my next slide, I want to thank you for your attention, and I think for questions and comments, um, there is a separate time slot at 10:45. Thank you very much for this presentation and the nice work. Donald from Hofer Institute. Uh, but the questions, uh, yes, we don't think we will have enough time because we are um, now far from following the schedule. But if attendees, please, you can use the chat to raise your questions during the presentation. This way we can answer it uh, quickly. OK. Now we will continue with the second objective of the project, which will be presented by Fernando Blázquez. Alda Safa and Christian Gender. Fernando holds a Master of Science in Chemical Engineer by the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. He joined in Madrid. Uh, he joined GMV in 2018 and has been working on GNSS user segment area. Let me first move you, Fernando, to presenter. Thanks, Francisco. Okay. Also, I will keep um, introducing you. Sorry. Um, his work. Uh, his work is mainly focused on performer assessment on different GNSS technologies. About Alda Safa, is uh, a PhD student at the Signal Processing for Communication and Navigation Group in the Department of Telecommunication and System Engineering at the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona. Her research interests are at the intersection of wireless communication and positioning technologies. Um, Christian Gender received his Master of Science and PhD degree in 2009 and 2018, respectively, both from the University of Ulm. He's working at the Institute of Communications and Navigation of the German Aerospace Center, DLR, since 2019, where his research focuses on multipath assisted sensor and indoor positioning. Okay, now, Fernando, I give you the floor. You can start. Thank you, Francisco. Good morning, I'm Fernando Blasquez and I'm going to give a brief description of Popecot software. Popecot stands for Positioning Performance Coverage Tool. And I am going also to describe the Genesis module and give an example simulation. Uh, Popecot software has been developed under the ESA project Gen 2 5G. As you can see in the figure, it, it is composed by three different modules. The Genesis module developed by GMB, the 5G module developed by UAB, 
and the fusion filter module developed by DLR. Uh, Popecot uh, software tool uh, shall be able to cope with different technologies that can, cannot be measured in laboratory or field and extrapolate to uh, trajectory and coverage positioning error uh, assessments. Therefore, it enables the user to anticipate the performing uh, or mainly in terms, in terms of positioning error and power consumption of different technologies and, of different, and in different environments. As you can see, three of the main characteristics of the tool are the use of 3D maps image formation, uh, including the building heights, the possibility to perform coverage and trajectory assessments, and the existence of general, specific, and general and specific parameters for each of the model, for each model. As you can see in the blue figure, the Genesis model is composed by two different submodules, the first one Polaris and then the boat, which stand, stands for Polaris Adaptation Tool. Polaris is a commercial of the cell uh, product developed by GMB, which is launched internally before the boat does. It generates the observation matrices per user position or trajectory point and it takes as inputs in the general and GNSS configuration parameters uh, where uh, are included in the scenario, the type of simulation, the simulation time span and time step, and also the constellations used. It also takes as input uh, the 3D map information and the grid of user position or trajectory points which are previously defined in Polaris. Once uh, Polaris uh, execution ends, uh, the pod submodule is launched. Uh, it takes as input uh, the observation matrices generated by Polaris per user position and also the uh, Genesis data calibration, which consists on uh, coverage matrices uh, per urban areas and also for open ones. Uh, this uh, information is obtained from the Munich campaign uh, which took place in the context of this project and in this campaign different combinations of GNSS receivers alone or in combination with different IMUs were tested. And finally, the boat is responsible for generating the Genesis positioning errors following a sequence, a Gaussian Markov sequence uh, for each uh, trajectory point or user position. It is important to remark that uh, when the IoT use case is selected, uh, the power consumption per user position or trajectory point and also per epoch is included too. Uh, this power consumption depends on a few extra para GNSS parameters uh, which only are considered when the IoT use case is selected. These parameters are the duty cycle of the receiver, the battery capacity, the lock and unlock consumptions and also the time to fix. In this slide are presented the results of an example simulation as well as the general and GNSS configuration parameters. As you can see, this is a coverage assessment uh, with a simulation time span of one day and a time step of 900 seconds using the GPS and Galileo constellation. It uses uh, the low-end GNSS receiver in combination with the low-end IMU. Uh, it, it is located in Tres Cantos and this scenario is selected uh, because it presents a combination of open and urban areas. Because of that, uh, the two different CDF presenting the horizontal positioning errors are presented. Uh, the first one for urban points and the second one for open points. Both of them uh, presents follows a Gaussian distribution and as it was expected uh, the GNSS horizontal position error is greater 
for is greater for urban points than for uh, uh, open points. This difference is uh, it's measured with a 99% percentile uh, placing seven meters for urban points and 2.5 for open points. Sorry, uh, as you can see, uh, this conclusion is also observed looking at the heat map. And it is important to remark that uh, the, uh, the horizontal position error presented in urban areas depends on both the height of the buildings and also the proximity between them. The, the higher amount of buildings and the closer they are between them entice a greater horizontal position error. As you can see in the map, the areas with a higher amount of buildings are also the ones with a greater horizontal position error. And finally, three different simulations uh, has been done in order to see the power consumption of the IoT GNSS receiver. The, as you can see, the uh, lock consumption is lower than the unlock consumption for all the simulations and uh, the only parameter different between them is the number of constellations used remaining the the, the rest of the parameters uh, with the same value uh, as, as you can see uh, a lower number of constellations and there's a lower number of available satellite satellites and therefore, taking into account that the unlock consumption is greater than the lock one, the, there are more areas with a higher, higher uh, power consumption than when a lower number of constellations is used. Uh, it is important to remark also that the areas with the highest power consumption are the same ones that were presented in the previous heat map with a highest uh, horizontal position error. Now uh, Alda is going to continue explaining the 5G module. Alda, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Okay. Good morning. Okay, okay. Good morning, Alda. Uh, well, as Fernando explained, uh, part of this uh, simulator tool is the 5G1 that I'm going to present today, which is composed by uh, four main blocks, the system level simulation, the determine the link budget, the loss propagation conditions, and the power consumption levels. Uh, once these parameters are determined, uh, we go to the physical layer simulation where the Langer errors are modeled using the 3GBP channel models according to the standard. Uh, once the ranking errors are uh, computed, we can now uh, go to the uh, ranking observables that are generated by considering the, four, the 5G and the 4G ranking error models that uh, were com computed uh, previously. Once we have uh, the ranking observables, then we can compute the position uh, solution for the 3GTP uh, positioning techniques, uh, taking into account also the type of scenario that can be trajectory or coverage and the configuration files with all the uh, parameter inputs that we will explain later on. To the next slide, uh, we can see more insights on what, what is inside these uh, building blocks. In the simulation uh, level, you can see uh, all the uh, main uh, blocks where you can uh, first uh, generate the, the deployment of base stations. We, can, uh, we have to remind that uh, there are two possibilities in this simulator. You can uh, rather uh, put predefined pos uh, positioning of BS, uh, the base stations, or you can simulate the base station according to the distance based on the user equipment that are uh, 
pre-put in a recorded file. Uh, you define the network models. Here we take into account the network inaccuracies uh, that are related to the uh, synchronization uh, errors of the network, determine the loss conditions, uh, and compute date billing budget. Then we skip to the physical layer where the uh, 4G and 5G uh, physical layer observation are simulated really, uh, according to the signal, type of signal that can be the downlink one or the uplink one that are uh, dedicated to the positioning. For the downlink, we have the PRS signal and the, for the uh, uplink, we have the CRS signal. Uh, once we generate these uh, signals, we can compute the time delay estimator as the maximum peak cor of correlation between the received signal and the pilots within a correlation range. And then uh, we uh, compute the CDF of these ranging errors uh, per SNR of the signals. And then uh, by doing an interpolation, taking into account the loss probabilities and the SNR, we can compute the ranging errors depending on the system bandwidth that has a range up to uh, 100 megahertz and uh, the color frequencies uh, that has a range up to 6 gigahertz that belongs to the first group of uh, the frequencies. Then we skip to the observable generations uh, having into account the ranging uh, errors. Uh, we can compute the observables. Uh, here we um, can uh, say that uh, we can have the uh, two types simulated ranking errors that are done by the simulator or empirical models that are uh, ranking uh, errors that are calculated by uh, real uh, computation that are done by companies that were prev uh, previously presenting in this presentation. Uh, to the next slide, we have uh, Brink. Uh, a, a scenario that is the same scenario that Fernando explained, uh, but in the terms of 5G uh, positioning. As you can see on the uh, right part of the presentation, we have the base station distribution that are, is done according to uh, radio parameters that we set as input parameters. Uh, in this case, we have only uh, a distribution where the base station has an interside distance to, uh, to 200 meters. Uh, on the left side, you can see a heat map where it's clear that in the open areas we have more error positioning than uh, in the center where the density is higher. Uh, to have more insights, we skip to the next uh, slide. Then we have uh, here the result, positioning results according to the three uh, GBP position techniques, that is the uh, OTDA, RTD, and UTDA, when in uh, conditions of uh, perfect synchronization network, we see that uh, RTDT performance is between the OTDA and uh, U, uh, UTDA. But if we put some uh, uh, synchronization error to the network, to, to the next uh, results, we can see that RTDT performs better than OTDDOA that was uh, before. Uh, also, we want to bring how impact is in terms of uh, uh, when we have a lower system bandwidth and uh, if we put uh, the presence of n loss BS where the PAD delay normalization is removed, to the next uh, results, we can see clearly that with a system bandwidth of 20 megahertz and the presence of NLOS BS, the, the, the positioning accuracy degradates uh, compared to when we have a maximum bandwidth. Uh, well, this is uh, just uh, an overview of uh, what the simulator can cover and how the results came up with uh, different scenarios with uh, different uh, input parameters. Thank you. Now I give the, my turn to Christian that will uh, go with the, the final part of the module. Christian, it's your turn. Good morning, everybody. Fernando, can you put the next slide? So, 
As uh, Fernando and Alda already mentioned, uh, is uh, the tool, the PurpleCat tool, and what uh, DLR on, uh, was doing is we did uh, from the different modules, we did the fusion. That means we took their, their measurements from the GNSS module and from the 5G module and fused it together to get the position estimate. Next slide, please. What we got is we got from uh, the from GMV, that means from GNSS, uh, PurpleCat uh, uh, port estimate, we get the position estimate. That means this could be also using an IMU and uh, RTK. And from the side of the 5G module, we got the position estimate. Uh, we could get a TDA estimate or this RTT estimate. And uh, with this kind of measurements, we had the possibility to fuse them in different kinds of ways in order to get a position estimate. Next slide, please. So how does it look like? I put it in a little bit of a graphic how we did this. And uh, first, what we did is on the left side, you see that uh, we did a position fusion. In the middle, you see the position TDA fusion. That means we take the position from the GNSS module and the TDA from the 5G module and fuse together. And on the right side, you see the fusion of the position of the GNSS module with the RTT uh, uh, measurement from the 5G module. And uh, in principle, in the first uh, row, you see when everything is right accurate, we can get really good position estimate out of it. So, for example, on the left side with the position fusion, we see these both circles, the gray circle should indicate their the GNSS position estimate and the blue circle, the 5G estimate. And if they're lo really looking uh, are close and having low variance, we can get a good position estimate out of it. Similar if you have the TDA, which uh, is the hyperbolas, what you see there from between the different base stations. And if they're intersecting and we get in the same range their GNSS estimate, we can get a really accurate position estimate. And on the right side as well, the RTT fusion, which is which means or the T means uh, it's the line or the the diver path it means uh, uh, it's the distance measurement between the between the base station and the mobile user and that means uh, the position would lie on on a circle and if you fuse this together with the GNSS estimate and if the inner second we could get a good position estimate but the reality actually looks most of the time really different so what we have is that we have an Genes estimate is most of the time really good, or in, if you're going to an um, urban scenario, it's not that good anymore. And also with the with the 5G estimate, it depends on the kind of environment what is used. And so you see in the lower part how it in reality would look like. That means we have in the left side that maybe the even the estimates of, of the position are really far from each other. And if we still have to fuse them together, to obtain a good estimate, and it means we have to weight them accordingly to, to perform good. In the middle, you see it, for example, with the T2A, where T2As are really far from each other, we have no intersection, and also the, the GNSS estimate is not close to it, and the right as well with the circle and the, the GNSS estimate. The, what I indicated here by this uh, symbol from Google, it means that this is the position estimate that we, what we get at the end. Please, next slide. So what we had to do is we had to, to, use, to fuse it and there are different kind of ways how to fuse the different position estimate and we concentrate in two different engines. In the IoT case, what Fernando already presented, uh, where you saw this heat, uh, this heat map of the power consumption, what we did there is we used our static fusion filter. Static fusion filter means that we use each estimate separately. So there are, there's no dependency and time of the different measurements. And we used here a least square algorithm. You see here on the left, for example, if we are moving through an, an area, then each of the measurement or estimate is, is independent from the other. In case of what we also looked in is this heat map where we had uh, we looked on different points. We see it here, then each of the points on the right side, each of the points are calculated separately and they're not depending on each other. Then on the on the other side, we used a, a dynamic fusion filter. This can be, for example, an external Kalman filter. And uh, what we used here, we used here a particle filter. The particle filter, we thought it's in this case better because it uh, copes with all kind of linearities and we we can use it in a better way. So on the left side, you see it where, what the particle filter or dynamic fusion filter is doing. It's uh, it 
uses as well not only the estimates, it uses also a prediction filter. It means, uh, for example, if you're moving uh, to the city using your GNSS receiver, there's the uh, external command filter behind where it predicts the next steps what you're doing. And this is to be done, uh, is done, this, uh, it is a particle filter as well. That means we are using a prediction model in order to say where the next position could be and fuse it on the next point. And so it gets, it gets a smoothing of the position. On the right side, we see this as well. If we have a only one point scenario, that means even if you have only one point, then also this 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 behavior that it's realized that okay, we are standing more or less helps us to get a more accurate position estimate. That was a short overview of this. Now I want to show you the results. Please next slide. We saw this this, this uh, more or less this slide already. This is the scenario we were looking on in uh, for this uh, simulation or uh, for this uh, presentation. Here we see. The different points where we where we had a look on. That means this is, uh, I think it's Tres Cantos uh, in near near Madrid. We have a look where we have an urban scenario and an open scenario, and we had a different measurement points where we were looking. This uh, this uh, indicated by blue. That means in this points we did the evaluation. Next slide, please. And then we can see here now the result. So what we see here, we see in blue the pole position estimate, and then in red the 5G estimate, in uh, yellow the, the fusion of pole and 5G position estimate, and in purple then the uh, uh, fusion of pole position, and in this case T2A. What we first see is that uh, the 5G, uh, the pole position estimate with the 5G position is better than the pole position with the 5G T2A position. And actually this is something which is I would say weird because usually if you have go look on the raw data which is the 5G TDUA and not a position this should be performed better and in general it's like this but what we have here is uh, that uh, in the simulation from the 5G pot, uh, 5G position estimate uh, there is assumed that the knowledge of the error of the TDUA estimate for calculating the, the position and that's what we don't assume here. So that's why we have one information less, and that's why the, the accuracy is not so good. If you now look on the different as in a different kind of uh, uh, environments, we see here on top then the open environment. And uh, what we see here really clear in this open environment, the 5G estimate is not that good compared to the compared to the uh, the genus estimate. And if you look on the urban environment, which is lower part, we can see it's flipped around. So in this case, actually, the pole position estimate is not as good as the 5G estimate. And uh, if you go to the next slide, we can see this now also in the heat map. These are the heat maps uh, which were presented already by Alda and by Fernando. And now we have here on the left side the pole position and in the middle then the 5G position. And both scales are equivalent. It means going from zero to five meters uh, as maximum and then more than five meters is totally red. So we see here that the pole position is performing really good in the open areas and in the urban areas it's rather low I would say. And, uh, and the 5G position is uh, we have a good accuracy in the in the urban area and a lower accuracy in the open scenarios, depending on the number of base stations that we have here. So on this one, we if you want to fuse this now, we may be more or less taking the, these two measurements and put them together. So next slide, please. So what we can see now, it's we see now the fusion and we see that with uh, both fusion algorithm, we are able to combine the good values more or less from the pole position and the 5G estimation and in a fusion kind of sense in order to improve the position estimate. And that's what you see on the lower with, uh, with the pole position and the 5, uh, 5G OTDA estimate on the left. And we see here that we are a little bit worse in this, in this uh, in this uh, urban areas and on the right where we fuse, I just uh, said before, where we fuse the port position and the 5G position, we are more or less accurate in all kinds of areas. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Fernando, Alda and Christian for showing us all the nice work developed in this part of the project. Um, I'm gonna share now Okay, so Daniel is the next panelist. He's a software developer at Brothers Worth, and he has been working for three years in location-based services department. 
Among other projects, he developed the first prototype for an RTK positioning simulator. Uh, we're uh, really, if, if, if please, I will encourage you to go a bit faster because we will need to have like at least five minutes of question and answer and also the next presentation. Let's try to, to recover the time. So, okay, Daniel, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you as well. Um, good morning from Munich and thanks a lot for having us. Okay, so let me jump right into it. Um, when we talk about uh, traditional GNSS positioning, we talk about accuracy in the range of um, meters. Um, without going into details, um, by utilizing um, correction data streams, it is possible to um, achieve centimeter level accuracy. Um, one of these techniques is um, called RTK, which is short for uh, real-time kinematics. And that is uh, what we built or what I developed uh, with my team, um, a prototype for a simulator for, to simulate an RTK environment to test um, RTK receivers. Um, so, but first um, let's answer the question how such correction data um, arrives at an RTK simulator. There are several, um, several possibilities uh, thinkable. Uh, one way would be to broadcast uh, via a satellite signal. Another way would be to utilize um, system information blocks in the 5G protocol. Or finally, um, which I think um, would be the most flexible and straightforward option, is to just use top IP communication um, channels um, using LTE and 5G networks. Um, since the technology has been around for quite a while already, there's a, vi a variety of existing standards to choose from. Um, specifically, I want to point out here that in 3G GPP's uh, specification for LPP and SAPL, message formats for um, GNSS correction data are already defined. Um, that way, 4G and 5G networks um, could easily be used to broadcast correction information even today. By um, taking a rather um, popular example um, of autonomous driving, uh, one could say that people's safety rely on technology. Um, that inherently means that testing is vitally important. Um, specifically for high accuracy positioning, um, it's therefore crucial to test um, receiver protocol compliance, receiver performance and integrity, as well as antenna performance. The test setup, um, Rode and Schwarz uh, aims to provide for that, um, looks like this. We have a, a satellite simulator um, paired with a 4G and a 5G network simulator, and uh, those are connected to DUT. So the DUT is directly connected uh, receiving an RF signal from the um, satellite signal simulator, um, whereas the correction data will arrive at the DUT um, using, for instance, a, a 5G NSA um, link. Um, we prepared a quick video of, of um, the demo that's rather Fresh from the oven, a colleague of mine recorded it yesterday. Um, we'll see here um, the satellite simulator that um, also um, provides an RTK correction stream. And then we will look how the, the receiver um, behaves. So this is a remote view of the satellite simulator. Um, we switch on the simulation. Here we um, enable the uh, RTK correction stream and request is being, being started. Um, and the um, simulation environment should already be set up. Um, we use a U-Blox receiver here. We set it up to listen to a certain um, correction data endpoint. 
um, which is uh, an entry endpoint. And here we um, go and observe the signal information that we receive here. Uh, so um, on the right side, you can see um, the receiver already sees a few um, uh, satellite. Um, it is using pseudo ranges at, at this point. Um, it's in total six satellites, which are um, being simulated. It's a, a multi-frequency scenario using L1, L2. And um, on the very right, you can see in green, there is a float um, solution already available. The receiver is using pseudo ranges as well as carrier phase measurements at this point. Um, an integer ambiguity fix has not been found so far. It's still converging towards one, but at this point we're still at a, at a float fix, as you can see. Um, one thing to point out here, um, one, um, one of these satellites has a elevation that is too low, so it's disregarded. Um, that means it's actually just five satellites uh, that are being considered for uh, the solution. And sorry, that was a little bit too far. Let me scroll back here. At this point, we jump from a float. Let me stop it for a second. Um, from a float fix, which has an accuracy of about um, 3D, nearly five meters, 2D, um, 2.17 meters. And um, the, con, uh, the, the solution converges to an integer fix. Great, I restarted it. Uh, at about this point, let's see. Here we have a fix. Uh, you see it on the right, 3D G differential GNSS fixed. And the accuracy is at nine centimeters in 3D and four centimeters in 2D. Um, here we can see um, the simulator um, working with a different um, receiver software. This is RTK Lib, which is open source. Um, and we also um, wanted to show a different scenario. It's, um, it's single frequency multi as You see in total um, 12 satellite, satellites um, for each, um, four satellites from um, GPS, for Galileo, and for Baidu, um, also resulting in, in a solution fix or in an integer ambiguity fix, which you can see on, on the left here. In addition to the RTK capability of the simulator, the GNSS generator is able to simulate uh, various error sources, such as a multipath, body mass, antenna patterns, um, additive white Gaussian noise, uh, interference, jamming, loss of fix, phase jumps, and so on, lots more. Um, additionally, with the Roden Schwartz 4G and 5G network emulators, um, one can simulate fading, also white noise, and a lot of um, network configurations. So to conclude, um, um, with the shown setup here, um, it's possible to um, stress test RTK receivers and 5G receivers in, in the lab under very challenging uh, conditions. And that's from that's all from my part. I tried to speed it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, for such a nice and interactive presentation. This is the end of the workshop session one. We will have now the coffee break until 11. Uh, we will also solve some of the questions raised by the attendees during the presentations. Fran, I have a question that mm -hmm. I want to raise. I will take it in the order of the speaker. So first question is for Max. It's, uh, it's about the positioning results in the loading zone. So that the first set of the results 
uh, were following closely the true trajectory, but in the second set of the results for the same scenario, there seems to be some displacement between the the measured position and the true trajectory. Any idea uh, why that might have happened? Um, so the positioning calculation was a little bit different for the 5G alone and the hybrid um, measurement. For the hybrid measurement, we did um, some some weighting for the um, TOAs that didn't always go well. And um, also different reference um, TRPs were used. That was a little bit unlucky, but um, if you if you um, have just five TRPs, you have to choose one as reference for your TDOA. And depending on the TOA quality of this one TRP, um, everything might be a little bit different. Okay, thank you. Fran, I think we have more questions, right? Yes, I have one question for Alda. In urban results with 5G, I understand these results are obtained with a simulator. Is the assumed network of 5G based stations representative or real deployment? Uh, well, in the simulation that we presented today, our uh, simulated base station are not predefined uh, base station deployment. So the simulator uh, deploy the base station according to the position of the user equipment. So uh, in which user equipment, they are deployed around seven base stations or, or more, depending on the number that you put as an input per meter and taking into account the inter-site distance. For instance, in our simulation model that we presented was an UMI deployment where the inter-site distance between base stations is 20, uh, 200 meters, so it's uh, a more density network, but it can be uh, possible if you put a predefined network, but in this case, we just simulated the deployment of the stations. Okay, okay, thank you. So all thank the you, stations, yeah, are, are focused around the urban area, and if you see why, if you had a look on the picture that I uh, presented, the uh, part of the area that is rural, the base stations are far from the users. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. I have another question. This is for Daniel. Um, any test also done with SSR, PPP, RTK, instead of only OSR? Um, no. Actually, for our prototype, we only did um, OSR testing so far. Okay. <clears throat> Fran, I think we have also a bundle of questions uh, for Jose Manuel, and they seem all related to, to synchronization. So I will ask all of them, Jose Manuel, and then you. <laughs> You take them one by one. So how are your BBUs and RRU synchronized? Is it PTP from an atomic clock? The second, what are the requirements? And the holdover between the baseband units and the edge clock of, of the LAN and the WN. And the last one, how to aim of tackling the issue of synchronization in GNSS uh, denial environments, uh, for instance, jamming and so on? Mm -hmm. Well, for the BBU synchronization, we have several kind of, of uh, options. We have the PTP and we have also the GPS. Uh, when we are talking about deploying 5G networks, we also recommend to our customers just to have a better accuracy, just not for, for the positioning, but for, for the mobility between the intel site selection. Uh, we also recommend the GPS synchronization for for the for the BBU. So that's the mainly, let's say, a tool that we are going to use for deploy 5G using the the GPS synchronization. In 4G, is 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 uh, is true that um, other methods uh, can be can be used, but for 5G, the requirement that what we recommend is GPS synchronization. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for all your, your answers. Now we are 
close to 11 so i think we the remaining questions we will will be answered offline and sent by email in a in a few days now i will introduce lionel Guy. he will moderate the second session of the workshop he is head of the navigation radio navigation systems and techniques section in the directorate of technology engineering and quality of isa the european space agency he joined ESA in 2016 as a radio navigation system engineer, supporting activities on future navigation system and concepts, both at infrastructure and user segment level, as well as on the standardization of 5G positioning in 3GPP. Beforehand, he worked in CNES, the French Space Agency, first supporting GNSS-related R&D activities, and AC on Galileo then leading CNES section for localization, navigation, signal, and equipment. Okay, Lionel, I give you the floor. Do you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we hear you and we see you. Okay, your screen so, I will, uh, so this morning panel one was about uh, 5G and uh, presented uh, the many opportunities and ongoing uh, development demonstration relating to uh, positioning. With uh, panel two, I propose you uh, a projection in, in the future beyond 5G and uh, aiming at uh, the 2030 uh, horizon. So we will have uh, on the agenda, why isn't it uh, moving to the next slide? Yeah, exactly, perfect. Uh, so our agenda will uh, contain uh, five presentations. I will uh, introduce uh, later on the, um, the speakers. Uh, a Q&A, but I would like to start with, uh, with a poll. Two questions, the first one will uh, give you a single choice and the second one will give you a multiple choice. As an introduction to the panel, uh, we will talk about mostly perspective by 2030, so IMT 2030, which is also known as uh, 6G. 6G standardization roadmap is sketched on, on this slide, extracted by a roadmap proposed by uh, industrial stakeholders of uh, 3GPP, like uh, Huawei, for instance, uh, showing well, what is happening and would happen in WRC, uh, with incoming WRC 2023, to discuss allocation about 6G and uh, RC27, which might be the allocation of uh, spectrum to 6G. You also see on this timeline the evolution of 5G. I release 15 is available, release 16 and uh, 17, as presented beforehand, are on the development and will be soon available. 5G will continue to evolu evolve uh, in parallel of uh, 6G with uh, additional uh, releases. And on ITOR, you will see that, uh, well, beside 5G evolution, there will be uh, investigation on technological trends, uh, a vision, KPI, mission drivers, uh, why, when, 6G proposal, and what will be important and probably the ground for our talk uh, in the incoming minutes is the technological background of uh, 6G. There are ongoing research, what are the capabilities, what are the new technological enablers that can uh, motivate and push uh, 6G beyond uh, 5G. So this will be our main topic. I will now introduce you quickly the two questions for the poll. I think you will have about 30 seconds to address uh, both of them afterwards. The first question about positioning accuracy. You have a single choice. How do you see the evolution of positioning accuracy in mobile cellular networks over the next 10 years? You would select one answer, one among the following, one meter, 10 centimeter, zero, one centimeter, or 10 meter. And the second question relates to the service area, so basically the type of coverage that we foresee. And here we would like to have your views, uh, one choice or multiple choice, if, if you want. We want to see the other step. Where do you see the priorities in terms of service areas for 6G positioning and timing features? Would you see them indoor, outdoor, in public networks? So here it is not about institutional or non-institutional network. It's uh, mobile network operator or within private networks, uh, industry 4.0 being one example, for example, uh, housing as well.
we have about 45% of the votes run. I think we can wait a bit more, a couple more seconds before we close the second poll. I think we're good to go. Okay, thank you all. So this concludes uh, my uh, introduction. We will see later on the result of the poll and now propose to move to our speakers. So our first speaker for this panel two is uh, Juan uh, Cremio, product engineer master and uh, in the telematic automotive sector in the FICOSA. He holds a PhD in telecommunication by the uh, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, UAB. Uh, Juan has been working more than six years in FICOS as product engineer master, working in the development of new telematics and high accuracy positioning products for automotive market. As product engineer, he is involved in the development of new products with the latest technology, including V2X, 5G, high accuracy genesis. He also works as associate professor in the University of UAB. Juan, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning everybody. Good morning from Barcelona. I hope that you can hear me and see the screen that I am sharing. Perfectly. Okay, perfect. Uh, as he mentioned, I work in FICOSA. It is a company in the, from the automotive market. Okay, and the idea of today it is make a quick overview of what, which, which is, let me say, the application of the 5G, 6G communication systems, and also the GNSS positioning systems in the in the automotive market, and how we see the, the future. Okay, as I see, as I said, I work in in Ficosa. Ficosa it is an automotive tier one. Tier one it is a supplier of components for the main car manufacturers. Okay, uh, we are located in in Barcelona. It was a company started in 1949. Uh, more focus in the mechanical parts like cables, mirrors, and these things. But in the last year, it has evolved to introduce also an important technological technological product in the in the portfolio. Here you can see, let me say, the different business units of the company. Initially, we started, as I mentioned, in the rear view systems and command and control. Okay, but recently, during the last 15, 20 years, they have introduced the new, more technological business area that I think that are key key components for let me say the vehicle of the future and for the automotive autonomous driving. You can see that we have the mobility components, ARAS cameras components, and also uh, the business unit for where I come from, that it is advanced communications. Okay, in this business unit we work in all the systems related to communications, 4G, 5G, and also to positioning. As I mentioned, one of the or one of the questions that I want to try to answer it is which is our vision of the vehicle of the future. I mean, if somebody asks me, what do you think that it will be the vehicle of the future? I think that it can be summarized in three main words. The first one, it is connected. I think that connectivity will be one of the key components of the vehicle of the future, and it is something that today it is already going inside the market. Now we already have telematic control units in most of the vehicles. Now for the emergency call and some basic services, but let me say, I think that it is something that is growing up with more multimedia services, infotainment, entertainment, and all these things in the vehicle. The second word that comes to my head, if I think, if I, if I talk about the vehicle of the future, it is eco-friendly, or let me say, green vehicles. Uh, it's day we have more pollution problems, and the vehicles are one of the main sources of this pollution. For this reason, in the future, we are evolving to, let me say, more clean vehicles, electric vehicles, and this kind of thing. And the third word that maybe it is one of the most important or the most disruptive, it is autonomous driving. I mean, now we are in the first stage, level one, level two, level three, where at the end we have autonomous systems that provide assistance to the main driver. Okay, but in the future, I think that the vehicle will be able to to ride by itself. I am not. A, I don't know if it will be 2030, 2035, 2027. Let's see. Okay, it is here. There are two important points: the regulation and the technology. Okay, that both have to be aligned. But I think that it will be a reality. 
for for an for thinking in these words, I also have I, I think that it is important to highlight which are the technologies that will allow it. Okay, regarding the connected infotainment and these things, I think that it is clear that 5G connectivity will be the main pillar. In the part of green or eco-friendly vehicles, here I think that we have the power train evolution. It is a trend that we are seeing. We are moving from uh, traditional engines to electrical, hybrid, and these things. Uh, but also there is an important point that it is the optimal routing, the traffic flow, and these kind of things. I mean, if we have to do more efficient cars and also make the cars move in a more efficient way. For this reason, I think that positioning can also 5G connectivity can be a key technology to to manage efficiently all the vehicles. And the, as I said, the last pillar and one of the most disruptive and more important, it is the autonomous, autonomous driving. In the autonomous driving, we will have different technologies okay, necessary to, to be able to achieve this level of, of let me say, this next, next generation of mobility. Oops, sorry. Re regarding autonomous vehicles, uh, I think that there are at the end five key technologies. Okay, one part it is data processing and software algorithms, one part it will be the actuators. Okay, but apart from that, I think that there are, let me say, three very important pillars of technology, okay, that will make uh, would make this evolution possible. When you talk, uh, when you think about the uh, autonomous driving, maybe everybody is thinking about ADAS, cameras and radars. Okay, this is a very important part, okay, but it is not everything. With cameras, ADAS and radar, you can know what is happening very close to the vehicle. You can know what is happening at 50 or 100 meters from the vehicle, but you don't have any other information. For this reason, I think that these two technologies, additional technologies, positioning system and connectivity, 5G, are also key players to be able to achieve the autonomous driving. Uh, and they are related with the with this talk and the project. I and mean, positioning it is a key pillar, it is clear. High accuracy positioning, I mean, to make autonomous driving, we have to meet the position of the vehicle, know what it is, and, uh, and with very high accuracy levels. I mean, we have to know if we are going uh, in a highway, if we are in the middle line, land, in the right land, or in the left land, okay, to take the decision. Therefore, high positioning, a high accuracy positioning systems are one of the key components especially in, in outdoors uh, environment with GNSS and these things. And I think that also will see an explosion of positioning systems for indoor environment, for parkings and this kind of scenario that we, we will also need a positioning solution. And the second technology uh, that it is also very important, it is the connectivity uh, 5G. Here we are not thinking only on the cellular connectivity, we are also talking about the direct connectivity between vehicle to vehicle. Okay, with car to car communications or B2X, cellular B2X technology. That it is a technology that at the end allows that the different vehicles talk between them. This is, this is very important because with the others we can know what is happening very close to the vehicle. But with the connectivity between the different vehicles, we can know what, what is happening farther away. I mean, for instance, if one vehicle detects a dangerous in a highway, they can say to all the other vehicles that are coming behind them, be careful that one kilometer here there is a danger. Okay, for the reason I think that this connectivity gives an enhanced range okay, of the perception systems. And apart from that, they also can allow cooperative driving. Okay, let me say intersections, uh, overtakings, and these things. Let me say that the, the vehicles can, can coordinate to do it in a better way. As I say, the idea it is just to, it was just to show an overview of what we think that it will be the vehicle of the future and the technologies that will follow them. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. And thanks for your assistance. Thank you, Juan. So I think we will keep the question for, for the end and uh, we'll also see with the, with the result of the polls uh, how much time we can allocate to, to all of them. Uh, thank you very much. So we'll now pass the ball to our next speaker from uh, GMV, Enrico de Dominguez Tijero, who works as a Genesis and Multisense Navigation Expert in uh, GMV and holds a Master of Science degree in Telecommunication Engineering and a Master in Space Technology. He joined GMV in 2000, first working in development of EGNOS and Galileo, and since 2009 in Genesis Software Receiver, Multisensor Fusion, Integrity Algorithm, Localization System for Autonomous Vehicle, and also 5G position. Enrique, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Lionel, for the introduction and good morning to all the attendees. Can you see my screen? Yes? Yes. Okay, 
then now it's my turn to guide you through this short journey into the future, in particular about positioning, integrity, and, and cybersecurity. So let's start having a, a glimpse of what 6G uh, aims to achieve. Okay, 6G vision uh, is to connect human, physical, and digital worlds uh, with a fabric of uh, 6G key enablers. Uh, among these enablers, uh, it's, there is a trustworthiness. Okay, so trustworthiness is a key enabler uh, that uh, with characteristics that are security, privacy, uh, availability, resilience, and compliance with ethica, ethical frameworks will be uh, will become fundamental requirements for the network design towards 2030. Okay, so and so this is going to uh, I don't know how. Okay, so. As we mentioned, as I mentioned, uh, trustworthiness uh, is key in 6G. Okay, we will uh, in the, in 6G in the future, mobile network uh, and its enabled applications will need to build trust among consumers and enterprises. Okay, 6G will need to ensure confidentiality and integrity of communications, data priva privacy, and operational resilience and security. This will translate into the promotion of security, privacy, and trust into all 6G aspects. In, into, uh, taking into a look into the 6G requirements, we see that 6G aims to achieve high precision positioning uh, in the order of centimeters. And when we apply this secure, private, private and safe, resilient uh, concepts to, to high precision positioning, we see, we find out that uh, we get to the conclusion that position integrity becomes essential. So, position integrity, what we understand uh, about the position integrity or the position integrity concept, concept was first introduced uh, and developed in the civilian aviation field. And it has been adopted in other fields uh, where it is also very important to know whether an information is reliable or not. For example, safety critical applications, liability critical applications. The position integrity concept is based on, on three key aspects. One, the first one is the, the measure of the trust. The measure of the trust that we can place in the correctness on the, the position information that the system provides us. Okay, for example, uh, given a navigation system providing the same position in two cases, it's not the same if in the first case one is informed to be within a 90% probability, within a two meter circle radio, uh, radius uh, centered in the estimated position, and in the second case, within a 100 meter radius circle. Of, co of course, uh, it's clear that along with the position information, it's also very useful to and important to provide a measure of the trust that we have on this position. Also, uh, the position integrity concept includes the, avail and the ability of the system to provide timely warnings to the users. And uh, the system also provides a real-time uh, real decision criterion for using or not using uh, the system. Okay, so position integrity uh, is already being studied in, within 5G. It's an emerging trend in, in 5G. And there's a study item uh, dealing with integrity in release 17, uh, currently ongoing. And the study focuses uh, on Genesis positioning and has introduced, introduced the, the positioning integrity concept in, in 3GPP and is considering a comprehensive list of events uh, with the capability of impacting on the positioning estimation. Events related with the generation and transmission of Genesis assistance data and Genesis uh, fear events uh, uh, regarding satellite, atmospheric, and also multipath and interference and spoofing events. And also events that may impact on the user equipment and the network location, uh, location server. This study has a limitation uh, regarding Genesis positioning, but in future releases is expected to, to continue with the integrity of the 5G uh, rad positioning, the 5G positioning techniques. And uh, to conclude, let's get, uh, get, get out the crystal ball 
and, and dig a little deeper into the possible synergies between position information and security and privacy in 6G. Okay, 6G will be designed to, so that it will be possible to continually, continuously monitor positioning integrity. This will help to, to provide secure location information. This secure location information will, the forecast is that it will be increasingly used in a security, as a security parameter for digital interaction, interactions in, in more general contexts. Imagine surveillance systems, payments, automated driving, uh, health monitoring, etc. Also, uh, we have uh, the, the issue that uh, in order to reduce power consumption for IoT and, and to enable massive location-based location connectivity for, also for IoT, it is likely that network and cloud-based localization solutions will become much more widespread than uh, what we usually do now, that is uh, provide positioning uh, using our own device, the device and its uh, based localization net solution. So the, the network and the cloud-based localization solutions will be uh, more important or will, will take a major role in, in position uh, computation. There's also another other, other capabilities that will emerge that are uh, somewhat like a channel charting that is, this consists on applying machine learning to channel state information, uh, generating a, a pseudo map uh, where the location of the different users or more user uh, CSI can be tracked uh, consistent, consistently uh, across the users and over time. This is not a, this map is not a physically representative, but can uh, can provide you a relation between a proximity of uh, users and and is very useful to enhance numerous uh, network functionalities. Okay, so uh, so with our position information being handled by network and cloud service providers, as well as by location-based service providers, we have a privacy issue that can only be overcome if the service providers can be trusted. Okay, this implies a challenge for the service providers that will have to protect themselves even more and reduce uh, vulnerab vulnerabilities and prevent uh, attackers to exploit them in order to uh, avoid the uh, misuse of the information of, of, of the users. So, I hope uh, you enjoyed this short trip to, to the future and thank you very much. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, well, we're almost in time. A little bit delayed, but it's not much. I will then pass the floor to uh, Florin and be quick on uh, the biography. I hope you uh, will uh, agree to uh, to have a short bio, Florin, as you already presented. So Florin received this uh, Master of Science uh, degree in Geomatic Engineering from uh, Polito di Milano in 2015. He's currently working in the Directorate of Navigation in ESA, where he contributes to R&D in Fort on new paradigm for space-based navigation and hybrid positioning based on Genesis and, of course, 5G. Florin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lionel. I will try to use a new platform for more interactive presentations, so I hope the technology will not fail me. <laughs> now especially when we're we, about to talk we are futuristic about... this morning yeah yeah indeed so i will just uh, like to share with you how i see the networks of 2030 and how space and uh, ground can be brought together for the benefit of the user as a first point for me to remark um, just two pnt trends that in my view are very relevant, at least I consider them to be very relevant uh, today and also for the future. In network based positioning has become more and more ambitious in a matter of a decade. So we have the 50 meter of E911 in 4G and today in 3GPP, we talk about submeter positioning accuracy to, to enable many of the commercial applications that these networks should supposed to, to address and enable. So that was the first trend and I think it will continue uh, throughout the decade. A second trend I am seeing is the integration of connectivity and PNT services into one system. And hopefully this system will be able to provide global coverage 
And for instance, an initiative in this direction is the Gili's mega constellation in, in Leo, which aims to provide uh, broadband connectivity and navigation information to its fleet of autonomous vehicles. And I'm sure that we will see more and more of such initiatives, private and maybe even public, uh, aiming at the same, um, same items. Well, of course, we have to, to look also to GNSS today and the future. And regarding GNSS, today we have four GNSS systems and all, of course, are operational. And we have also a number of regional navigation systems. Uh, during this decade, I believe all the GNSS systems will go through a modernization phase and the, the providers will gradually introduce new services and uh, capabilities. In addition to that, I also believe that we will see um, soon some additional regional navigation satellite systems becoming operational, for instance, South Korea or the United Arab Emirates uh, uh, concept. Then besides GNSS, in 2030, I think we will be discussing also about new networks, so new solutions. And I like to, to refer to this new network as a unified satellite and terrestrial networks. And the idea is to rely on satellites to achieve better coverage uh, of, uh, of users and to integrate the satellite uh, with the terrestrial component and to build a, a 3D network. So this concept is already in study for a couple of years in, in 3GPP under the non-terrestrial networks studies and work items. And I think together with GNSS, users then could fully exploit the potential of uh, radio-based navigation. So we can think about this uh, decimeter level positioning accuracy everywhere. We can think about ubiquitous coverage and so on. My expectation is that this unified satellite and terrestrial networks first will put more emphasis on addressing the connectivity and the communication parts, much like in the traditional uh, networks. And then they will evolve and include also positioning services and uh, signals. And of course, we cannot finish this without looking also a bit what may happen on the user side. And I believe the user um, will be in charge of aggregating and fusing information from all these um, sensors and systems for a better performance. We've seen, uh, so traditionally, network-based positioning is network-based, so the location is computed in the network, even if the user is the one that performs the measurements. But already in in the release 16 of 5G, we've seen some increased appetite in in enabling also uh, network radio positioning uh, on the user side. And well, besides the traditional components like GNSS and other sensors, uh, we can imagine to have also a 6G component which would be able to perform measurements on base station on signals broadcasted by base stations deployed on ground and space and fuse them together with GNSS accelerometers and other sensor into one uh, superior uh, positioning uh, solution. So this was uh, all I had prepared uh, for this topic on the 2030 PNT and 2030 networks. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Florin. Uh, as for the previous speakers, we keep the, the question and answer uh, for, for the end. Our next speaker from uh, Airbus, uh, Germany, will inspire us some vision about cross-fertilization between GNSS and beyond 5G system, could be 6G or other. The presentation is uh, will be made by uh, Dr. Jose Del Peral Rosato. He is a future program navigation engineer at Airbus Defense and Space since 2019 and holds a PhD degree on telecommunication engineering. He authored works on performance evaluation of 4G and 5G signals for positioning and conducted a theoretical and experimental research activity on hybrid genesis, LT and 5G localization. Jose, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and also the invitation to this panel. 
I'm going to talk about the cross fertilizations between Genesis and Beyond 5G systems. <clears throat> Mainly in one of the upcoming example use cases that uh, we see at Airbus is the urban air mobility. Uh, in this uh, use case, we are all already envisaging that uh, stringent requirements in terms of positioning accuracy, availability, security, and reliability are going to be pushed to the limits. And so, for instance, imagine here then the city Airbus, uh, a plane taxi that is you, you are going to, to fly around the cities for a uh, for efficient transportation. And especially in critical situations such as takeoff and landing, um, we already envisaged very uh, stringent requirements uh, at the level in terms of position accuracy and also very strong uh, security requirements against malicious attacks for the uh, navigation systems. So, here we already uh, see that no single navigation technology is going to be able to face all these challenges, even more in urban environments, uh, standalone. So what we see is that uh, there, is, there will be a combination of multiple PNT technologies in a hybrid system of systems. Here we have classified in different uh, pillars. First there is uh, satellite navigation, which includes Genesis, SWAS, and their evolutions. This is clearly the backbone PNT technology and indeed, it also provides time in services to the communication uh, infrastructure. Then we have the, the communication infrastructure from 5G to 6G that will provide data dissemination to the NSS. Uh, this will be very valuable. And also dedicated positioning solutions uh, using pilot signals. Uh, then we have a, a large variety of sensors that provide local and complementary navigation information. And finally, ad hoc navigation and other systems that are dedicated and deployed almost on demand for a specific task. So the, the trend towards these hybrid PNT systems is going to, to gain more traction and to be more important as the use cases start to demand more stringent requirements, especially when pushing uh, towards the operational limits of, of the NSS, in, for instance, in urban environments and also under interferences. So here we see that the synergies between satellite navigation and also 5G, 6G are going to be very important. And in terms of 5G, it will not only be in terms of terrestrial, but also in the non-satellite domain. Let's also, let's look first on the, on the uh, road towards uh, 60 PNT on the terrestrial side. Here on, the, on this figure, we show that in open sky conditions, in rural environments, high accuracy positioning is well covered by, by NSS. So while when we go to outdoor urban environments, we only expect that feature cellular uh, location methods and hybrid systems are going to be able to reach this uh, centimeter level accuracy. Clearly, the, the standard is pushing to, to these goals and, and it, there is lots of work uh, on this, on the standardization. And mainly it's because the, the current uh, key, key features of, of positioning can enable, could enable uh, the first steps towards the, these goals, such as high bandwidth and high, uh, high carry frequency, for high accuracy ranging, more antennas for angular, uh, accurate angular measurements, major network densification for better coverage and propagation conditions, and device-to-device -device communication, which could en enable comparative positioning. Uh, still, this, due to the recent completion of the first uh, specifications, uh, most of these features are not exploited uh, in commercial services, and they are only under uh, 5G test beds and, and, and trials. So we will need still few years uh, to have this uh, on the on the streets let's say so wh what is next uh, in terms of the road towards uh, 6g we have uh, we see multiple aspects the first one is the further evolution of the of the 5g positioning key features shown here like even higher frequency bands higher bandwidth more antennas etc then we will have a further cross fertilization uh, with genesis for hybrid navigation in terms of precise corrections, integrity messages, security enhancements, but also um, further integration of critical GNSS timing services. Then we will have um, a, a exploitation of 6G disruptive uh, features, such as the one of the configurable intelligent surfaces, which are as more smart reflectors in walls of buildings to enhance the network coverage. And also, finally, the enhanced navigation algorithms uh, based on the on SLAM, artificial intelligence, cloud, and machine learning, among others. So the main drivers will not only be the high accuracy and availability, but also the reliability and the security. 
So, and towards this, we will need to face uh, practical implementation issues for the future use cases. So, as a conclusion of this uh, of this slide, let me uh, first uh, let me just uh, comment two uh, two opportunities on the non-terrestrial domain. So, and the, and the the evolution. So, here here we see that the 5G non-terrestrial networks, which cover a wide range of platforms, such as drones apps and satellites, including the, the LEO, uh, are going to expand the network coverage beyond a local area, like in the, in the terrestrial. And then we have the, the other point that since lots of work has already been done on the 5G terrestrial position in the protocols and mechanisms, this could be adapted to, to the current standardization. So far in the 5G NTNT, it has advanced at a good pace, but uh, there has not been any uh, positioning solutions based on the, on the 5G NTNT uh, standard. So there is the need to, to further study, and there is an opportunity to include this in the future. On the Leo PNT side uh, and Leo Mega stations, there are more advances, but this is still at an earlier stage. Uh, most of the studies are based on signals of opportunities of, of using the, the communication system, uh, systems as signals of opportunity in terms of the Leo signals, and few of these systems already provide a dedicated and proprietary navigation and timing services. So on our vision towards 6G, uh, it's clear that 5G and uh, non-terrestrial networks and the Omega constellations are also there. And, but we need to design dedicated capabilities and complementary PNT capabilities uh, in systems at an earlier stage in order to have a fully joined uh, communication and navigation systems. So we will see further cross-fertilizations between GNSS and, uh, and 5G and beyond. Uh, both at the terrestrial and the satellite domain in order to uh, cover future use cases such as the one of urban and air mobility. So with this, I finish my, my talk and I thank you for uh, um, the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jose. So we now move to our last speaker of uh, the morning and panel two from uh, UAP. He will uh, inspire us uh, further and probably capture the presentation made beforehand with a talk on the key technologies enablers for 5G evolution, so-called 5G plus, and also 6G. The talk will be, the presentation will be done by Gonzalo Seco Granados from UAP. He received his PhD degree in telecommunication engineering from the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya in, in 2000, and the MBA degree from uh, IESC Business School in 2002. Until 2005, he was with the European Space Agency, involved in the design of the Calero system and application. Since 2006, he's with the uh, Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, UAB, where he is professor working on signal processing for satellite-based and terrestrial based positioning system. Gonzalo, the floor is yours. Okay, you hear me now, right? And see my presentation on my camera? Yeah, yes, we hear you, yes. Gonzalo. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, I thought that being the last one, I was going to be left with no time. And uh, that, would, that wouldn't have been bad because most of the things that I was planning to say have already been said. So, thank you. but you know, positioning is about accurate timing. Okay, okay, okay. Well, <laughs> and in that sense, it's good because uh, this means that we are all converging to the same ideas. Okay, uh, this was the vision uh, that um, we have in the research uh, domain for 5G positioning and also for 5G beyond position, beyond 5G positioning. And this is the, the, say, the idea that has driven research for the last uh, years, at least for some groups. Okay. We were thinking we we're in an environment like this one, where GPS is uh, probably denied, we could use a, a base station uh, and the signals from a single base station to obtain the position and also the orientation of the user equipment, in this case, the car. Uh, in, a, in a scenario where also there is uh, 
uh, where there is a, a lot of uh, multipath and the user equipment is not synchronized with the base station. So there is only one way uh, communication transmission. And also, if uh, in an environment like this, and only with only one base station, we could also provide rather like mapping capabilities. So to determine where the, the, there are the reflectors or the scatterers, or where are the buildings, or where are the other cars. And also, if we could achieve this, when the line of sight is blocked, because so only taking advantage of strong reflections. And an additional question is whether we could take, with new technologies, we could shape the environment in such a way that the environment could help us in the positioning. And also, if 5G or beyond 5G could work as a monostatic radar with the uh, side link uh, signal so device to device communication could also be uh, a means for positioning between devices okay Th these are the questions that have driven research in the last uh, years uh, some solutions have been found but there are still the problem is still valid for beyond 5g and 6g okay the status in 5g positioning in in the standards in 3GPP, localization with a link and downlink uh, time difference of arrivals uh, has been studied and proposed, also with angular measurements with angle of departure and angle of arrival, and also on uh, multi RTT uh, positioning. In the research domain, multipath has been turned from an uh, enemy to a friend because multipath can help in position the UE even with a single base station and uh, in a multipath uh, rich environment. So 5G can work also as a bi-static radar because it allows mapping of the environment and tracking of the, of, the, of the objects in the environment. And on top of that, 5G of course allows to share the, the location, the map, the object information, assistance information, DNSS corrections, and, and as, uh, as we have seen. However, further research is necessary because in, a, in, in release 16 positioning study item, basically with simulations, uh, the, the position uh, error that has been uh, shown is in the order of uh, three meters indoor, 10 meters, 10 meters outdoor with a latency in the order of seconds. But the study items and the use cases requirements require positioning errors in the order of centimeters, let's say 20, 30 centimeters. So basically there is still a big gap with uh, in the accuracy, latency, availability, and reliability, as also Enrique has mentioned, uh, between uh, what has been achieved so far and what are the uh, goals for uh, new user cases. So this is the positioning landscape that Jose has already uh, mentioned. Okay, we have seen an evolution uh, uh, of the standards. Uh, and then uh, nowadays we have very good Genesis accuracy exploiting career phase. And then we have the 6G vision of achieving centimeter uh, accuracy, uh, at least in, in, in small areas. Okay, these are the selling points of uh, 6G or the six, uh, the seven, let's say, technology enable, enable, enables. Uh, five of them, the first one, were already present in 5G uh, systems, uh, but have been now accentuated to, uh, in 6G. So there is a move for high to high carrier frequencies, even terahertz, this is a key element in 6G. So bandwidth will be even wider allowing better delay accuracy and delay resolution. We will have a larger number of antennas. Device to device communication maybe will be uh, more widespread than it is nowadays. The network will be more dense and the new items in 6G are probably intelligent metasurfaces or also called reflect, uh, RIS, uh, reflective intelligent surfaces and probably the uh, use of artificial intelligence and machine learning. We could say that 5G was the generation of uh, massive MIMO and millimeter wave 
and 6G, maybe it's the generation of ultra-massive MIMO, uh, re intelligent reflective surfaces, and terahertz. Okay, reflective intelligent surfaces are surfaces whose reflection can be controlled in an intelligent way with a small controller, but they are passive, they don't add energy to the signal. And uh, they can be very useful for positioning because they can add as new reference points. They can be seen as a perfectly synchronized additional base station. So here you can have like an, a scenario where you have two line of sights. They can be, they, you can measure the angle of departure from the wrist. So they can behave like an inverse radar where the user knows the direction measured uh, as it will measure from the wrist. And, they could also allow to exploit near field propagation effects and the curvature of the waveform. Artificial intelligence, machine learning is a growing field in, uh, in, in many areas, in many applications, and probably positioning will not be different um, because there will be a high, a, a large amount of high dimensional information taken from a lot of systems, with, uh, from a lot of sensors and with a, in different environments. And having physical models for all this information can be different. So uh, artificial intelligence can help in revealing hiding patterns in the data, and one of these patterns can be the position. Something that has been, that is becoming uh, <coughs> uh, relatively popular, has already been mentioned by Enrique, is uh, channel charting. It's, uh, let's say, uh, an unsupervised uh, extension of uh, fingerprinting, we could say. Okay. <clears throat> so basically, just to conclude, uh, what is 6G? Maybe 6G is the convergence of communications, uh, localization, also radar, and sensing, enabled by several technologies that have been mentioned, like metasurfaces, uh, artificial intelligence, large bandwidth, new bands, and uh, nevertheless, there are a lot of challenges uh, in front of us to make this uh, happen. Uh, this is discussed in a lot of detail in this uh, IEEE access paper. And some of these challenges are common also to GNSS. Uh, for instance, like uh, the power consumption in devices and the limitations in the hardware. Okay, uh, I think that's everything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gonzalo. I had a problem with uh, with the microphone. Okay, so this concludes uh, your presentation. Concludes the slides and presentation of this morning panel. Now we will enter the Q and A sessions. I would invite all the panelists, uh, presenters, to trigger uh, switch on their cameras so that we can uh, so that the audience can see all of us, including myself, of course. And uh, I will go through the the question that we received so far. In the meantime, if uh, the audience has some further question, I think you can still introduce them, and uh, Fran will uh, will collect them. Pass them to us. Uh, our first question was, uh, I think, addressed mostly to Enrique. So I will start with him, and then if someone wants to take further the floor, uh, it resonates with your introduction and presentation about trustworthiness and authentication. What could be the role of a cellular network in 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 this, in particular, any uplink or network-based positioning technique that could not rely on a processing done in the user equipment? assuming or fearing that this processing on in the user equipment could be tampered with uh, in order to produce uh, a wrong position. Uh, example in the question, we're giving a link, uh, RSSI, uh, ESSID, and so on. What do you think? Uh, well, uh, I don't know if I have understood the, well the, the question. The, the question is about uh, the, the uplink and, and, the, and the, the role of the cellular network, and in particular, any uplink technique, network-based te technique, uh, to uh, detect yes. uh, and prevent uh, tampering of the position in the user equipment. Okay, the the uplink, uh, or the, when you compute the position in the in the network, uh, it's obvious that uh, well, you have. Uh, 
the it's difficult to 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 tamper. I mean, you you need to authenticate the the user equipment in order to to perform that. So so it's difficult to to get inside to get the man in the middle attack to perform a man in the middle attack. But uh, well, these things kind of things uh, evolve and 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 in the app link, I think it's uh, it's maybe more more difficult. Okay, thank you. Um, next question would be for Jose, but uh, if someone else wants to, to take over afterwards, it's also open. How do you see the exploitation of uh, 5G and later on 6G in a future air mobility concept? And, and in particular, do you think it can work with existing uh, cellular network coverages? Yeah, so um, I think that the 5G and 6G are going to be a, a have a key role in the urban mobility. There is the need to, to have connectivity in order to, to solve the air traffic management issues that uh, will pop up. And uh, we will see how are the evolution of the current networks uh, in terms of exploitation of positioning solutions. Uh, the, the existing communication infrastructure is mainly based on the communication demands. So we will see how this uh, communication infrastructure can deal with the high accuracy position that we will need for, for, for these applications especially looking for integrity. So I would say that they are going to, to be more dedicated deployments uh, for certain applications, such as in critical uh, situations, um, like for take, uh, taking and take off and landing. And in those, in those situations, uh, there might be even um, yeah, on-demand deployments for, uh, for BNT. So let's see how, how, it, how it evolves uh, in terms of existing communication infrastructures and how this can uh, adopt the, the positioning capabilities at the different levels, uh, accuracy, availability, integrity, and, and security. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will also invite our other panelists to, to take the floor and, and complement the answer if they want. Uh, I think I understood Florin would like maybe to add something on, on this. And then yes. afterwards, Gonzalo, Enrique, or Juan wants to, to speak. Uh, I will give them also about one minute. Yeah, thanks. Um, for the for the urban air mobility, I think um, 6G would need to have also this uh, non-terrestrial component uh, to to achieve uh, 3D deployment, because especially for uh, for things that fly, uh, vertical positioning is very important, and the 2D ground network alone may not be fit for purpose. And there's also the problem of interference. And as far as I know, antennas are tilted more towards the ground. And that's why I think um, a satellite component could help a lot for uh, for this use case. Thank you. Gonzalo, Enrique, Juan, would you like to complement? OK, I see no reaction, so I presume uh, no well we will probably have uh, later further opportunities in in the wrap-up I'll go to two additional uh, question uh, more technological oriented maybe a bit more futuristic we see the, the trend towards high accuracy the presentation mentioned uh, decimeter level accuracy or, or below which means for conventional ranging techniques TDOA techniques synchronization well below the nanosecond um, I open the question to any of our panelists. How do you see the challenge of synchronization in 6G to achieve this level of accuracy? Would you see work run to that? Other positioning techniques that would be less dependent to synchronization? Who wants to take the, the floor first? Okay, I can I can start. <laughs> Just okay. break the ice. Uh, I think there's some some options today. For instance, the the two-way ranging that may allow some flexibility uh, regarding the synchronization part and i know also in 3gpp there's studies to to find workarounds uh, for the synchronization error which is a big a big challenge for all the other uh, one-way positioning techniques mm, that's that's all i had now from my side on this point 
Gerda, Gerda, en Misé, van mijn zijde, de trend dat we zien in de Misé in Automotive, dat ze in sommige applicaties, ze hebben al requesten in very high accuracy levels in terms of positioning. Oké, okay, Gerda, I don't know how it will evolve with 5G in the, and the synchronization level. Now, what we, the trend that I are seeing in the automotive, it is that, let me say, to, to improve the robustness and the accuracy in the positioning. Okay, with the current, let me say, 4G, 5G systems, what they are doing is mainly based on, I would say, sensor fusion or different sources of positioning. Could be a combination of them to, let me say, to minimize and assure this um, centimeter or decimeter level accuracy. I mean, combining the GNSS with the death reckoning, map matching, and also with the information of other sensors in order to, let me say, achieve this high accuracy positioning, okay, without having this high street synchronization requirements. Thank you. If That's I may, very interesting. If I may add Go ahead, Henrique. Yes, uh, no, apart from what it has been said and, and the obvious the, the problem of the synchronization that uh, obviously you can put uh, use GNSS to synchronize all the nodes. There's another talking about 2000, 2030 and the future. Another option maybe is to to use the 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 one-way measurements uh, from between nodes uh, in order to provide this synchronization between nodes. I mean. I am talking about uh, auto synchronization of the network using the same measurements uh, that they want to to use for positioning, also for synchronizing the the different nodes. But that is only a, a thing that will have to be researched in the in the future. Yeah. So, um, I think that the like two, two trends, one that it's more the, the global solution, that it's basically on Genesis, and for this, for sure, there is the need to, to complement uh, the current services with, with more uh, for critical applications, and that ensures uh, the, the timing uh, availability and timing security and accuracy in the, in the right uh, moments, and then one that can be more local, that, uh, yeah, complementing to, um, yeah, Related to what uh, the other panelists were commenting, yeah, it can be based on on the 5G based uh, or 6G based uh, measurements, but also on other systems. Uh, in these other systems, uh, it can be from dedicated uh, deployments uh, to uh, to use this um, synchronization. That it's uh, also the work ongoing, in, as uh, Brian was commenting, some uh, time resilience uh, study items. And, and then as well, the use of the, of the satellite part, but from the communication side, the, the fact that uh, there might be 5G NTN, uh, there could be these uh, relays of timing synchronization, even based on, on GNSS at the, at the background, or even using their own, uh, their own clocks. So we will see uh, how this, uh, this evolves, but I, I see two trends, one more global and one and the other more uh, local in a specific uh, on-demand deployment, let's say. Yeah, uh, let me add just something. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I think that uh, if, if you use multi-base station uh, solution, it's clearly that base station need to have to be synchronized. And uh, well, pro I think it's quite clear that uh, Genesis will provide a solution for this. And in the complexity of the base station that we have seen, for instance, in the CTE presentation, uh, adding a Genesis receiver there, even a very accurate with high accuracy correction and so on, that does not seem to uh, does not give the impression that this will add to the to the whole complexity of the network. I mean. And but on the other side, the Genesis will fail indoor scenarios or holes or things like this or factories. And this is why one of the visions of 5G position positioning and 6G positioning was positioning with a single base station. If you really make a reality to the positioning with only one base station, then synchronization is uh, irrelevant because the base station will work like a radar basically or something like this. Thank you very much. Well, I will extend a bit this discussion beyond the typical urban environment. We see a lot of the presentation and discussion turning around dense and 
high density for the network, urban uh, mobility, urban areas challenging uh, urban canyons. What about rural areas where there would be surely also challenging environment, mountains, natural canyons? We could even think of indoor in a rural area, uh, farming and so on. How do you see this? And can any one of you can take the floor first and then I will uh, go through uh, the other panelists. Yeah. Uh, go, 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 go. Okay. Yeah, uh, for the when it's going beyond the local area, beyond the, the urban, again, the, one of the, the key solutions is to, to move to, to broader uh, platforms, either as I was commenting in the presentation from 5G non terrestrials, and this can range from, from drones, hubs, or, or satellites. So I could say that in all of this range of platforms, there can be some solutions that can uh, even target the, these indoor to outdoor transitions. And, and then if we go only to rural indoor, then it, this, I would say that uh, it really requires more on demand, uh, on demand deployments. Okay, I can also intervene on this one. And fully aligned to Jose, I think we, we need to consider non-terrestrial components here being uh, satellites or hubs or drones. And as you could see in the presentation I gave, I think by exploiting these uh, flying platforms and for instance, satellites in LEO, the, the coverage of a given system uh, expands greatly. And on another uh, note, also compared at least to GNSS, these uh, platforms closer to earth would have better link budget and the signal will appear more stronger to users or for forests and and other type of environments where GNSS is denied, this could help. And also take into account the hybridization of the different uh, signals that are available. I mean, hybridization will become very important in these kind of environments, even if uh, GNSS is almost denied, denied uh, completely, but you have a few signals from GNSS uh, once uh, receiving signals from one node, from at one terrestrial node, and you have other other signals from hubs or or NTN, hybridization will will become uh, an important uh, solution. Okay, thank you. Well, I think it links to uh, Juan uh, presentation and also answer about sensor fusion and even massive uh, sensor fusion. Uh, going to you, Juan, you focused on mobility autonomous vehicle autonomy level five if we go for the crystal ball and and are highly speculative and not uh, committing on, on the schedule when do you see this appearing uh, in our landscape I, I, I think that let me say this question it is it, it is difficult to answer because the, there are two points the technical point that i think that it can be answered uh, more easily and then there are also the legal framework necessary for this kind of for this kind of applications, let me say regarding the technical path that it is the one that I can answer. I th I, I will say that I think that the initial technology it is almost here. I mean there has been with different OEMs and different testings, and this one showing that with the current technologies at pilot level it is feasible to go to this level five autonomous driving. From this one to the mass market, there are still an important gap. But I think that from, let me say, from technical point of view, I think that in not very large time, let me say 2025, 2027, I think that technically it, it should be feasible to start doing deployment. Maybe not mm, mass level or let me say to all the, all the population, but I think that it can start some initial deployments in a uh, open road with with no problem. But as I said, I think that there will be also this part more related with the legal part and something like that. Therefore, I don't expect to see real uh, autonomous level five before 2030 or something like that. So okay. until 2030, we won't be able to buy uh, an autonomous car. I don't know. I mean, now now in Tesla they they have some. Let me say it, I will not say level five, but I mean it is evolving quite quite fast. But I don't know if the technology is evolving quite fast. Regulation, I don't know how it will evolve. 
Let's yeah, see. regulation, regulation is insurance and. I mean, in Europe, they have been already done tests or with, let me say, more than 2,000 kilometers with open road traffic conditions and it has a success. I mean, that the technology, let me say, it is almost here, but it is still pending the regulation and also the social acceptance of the technology yeah. that it can be difficult. Thank you. So we are close to the end of our panel uh, number two before going to the poll and uh, discussion on the result of the poll i would like to to bring one last question to uh, our last panelist uh, Gonzalo, who introduced the uh, future technologies would like to have your view which one is uh, according to you again crystal ball speculation according to you which one is the, the most likely uh, to be adopted in the next 10 years and, and re to emerge as a as a game changer uh yeah it's difficult to say yeah but uh, uh, for me the impression is that um, maybe it's these intelligent surfaces uh, not only be because of the surfaces themselves but because there is the need maybe to exploit multipath for positioning uh, we have always been the idea have the idea that non-line of sight multipath reflections are degrading positioning performance and uh and yeah it, it's the case but this will always be present in urban scenarios, indoor, and uh, maybe there's, if we really want to achieve centimeter level, the, we, we, we have to take advantage of multipath and uh, instead of trying to combat multipath. And this can be done with the algorithms, uh, like uh, estimating the multipath, estimating the position of the reflectors and so on, but also maybe introducing control multipath that you can take advantage of, of it yeah, this is my impression okay thank you very much um florin i was not sure whether you wanted to add something uh, for this one or not no no i think okay. Gonzalo well then we can go to to the poll so i will uh, well th first thanks all our panelists uh, and also thanks to the audience for their question and for this uh, fruitful and inspiring talk i uh, propose we now move uh, for uh, to the poll results pretty sure you're all impatient to, to know the answers uh, from the audience uh, so maybe fran you take uh, the lead and, and the floor here to present our audience uh, the results uh, should I comment? So for the first poll, we see a uh, for sure a major trend below the uh, below the meter. Only five percent uh, uh, seem to consider that the accuracy will uh, will remain. Uh, mostly somewhere in between ten centimeter and one meter. If I uh, follow well uh, and, and read well the outcome of the of the poll, with however more appetite towards better accuracy. Uh, Maybe Fran or Florin, you want to comment also on this uh, first poll, or you prefer to wait for the, the second uh, set of answers uh, before triggering the comments? Well, I, I, I can quickly add that I share the view. And the 10 centimeter, I think, would be the next milestone to go for. I think below one meter is already targeted. Of course, it's a different thing if it will be achieved or in under which scenarios and conditions. But I, I see no reason not going beyond uh, beyond what is targeted today in the in this decade. Thank you. We can launch on the second poll if you wish. Okay, sure. Let's go for the second one. Can you see it? Yes. So here, well, looking at this coverage area in terms of indoor, outdoor, there is a clear uh, trend towards indoor and uh, much more uh, higher priorities towards uh, indoor. I think it is uh, quite clear. Obviously, from all the presentation, we mentioned autonomous vehicle, air mobility, rural areas. Outdoor is still important, but it looks uh, from the audience that the main trend will go to indoor. I see it much more balanced uh, between public network and private network. So probably this reflects also a lot on the diversity of use cases. Uh, outdoor, indoor, uh, industry 4.0 and its evolution, uh, but also uh, automation and uh, machine control. 
wide area coverage, drones, and, and so on. Florin, Fran, would you like to further comment? Okay, yeah, I can start. Like okay, so yes, like please go, go, go ahead. Mm. Yes, I mean, here, let me say, that I, uh, in the auto, from the automotive point of view, where I am aligned, let me say that outdoor, I think that the, with the current technologies, the positioning, it is more or less solved. Okay, where it is missing, it is the positioning, especially in indoor scenarios where GNSS, it is not existing, and these things for the reason I align. That one of the priorities for, let me say, 5G, 6G and new positioning technologies should be to improve the indoor scenario where GNSS uh, is dead, let me say. On, on the indoor point, um, seeing the results from the audience makes me think that this industry 4.0, smart manufacturing, smart factories and so on, it seems that for people will continue to be the main the main driver for positioning in, um, in mobile networks also during this decade. I'm also surprised to see the, um, the, the tight between public networks and private networks. Uh, I would expect to see public networks uh, less in the percentage and focus more on the private ones because the deployment could be tailored to address uh, positioning uh, applications and requirements. Okay, very good. Well, Florin, Fan, as you are organizer, I will now pass you the ball for, for the wrap up, uh, whether you want to uh, have comments from our panelists on, on this poll or further question from the audience, uh, up to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lionel. We have more questions, but I think we will solve all of them. Um, uh, send in an email. Also, we will send this this workshop recorded. Um, so anyone that is not joining today can be able to watch it offline. We have had more than 200 people in script in the event. I have seen the numbers and sometimes we have had 120 connected. So I assume that the rest of the people is not fitting their schedule but at least they are interested. I also think that it's been a, a nice workshop with very nice questions raised, actually, by the attendees. Um, well condensed and focused. Um, I think I, I really like it. What did you think maybe for him? Yeah, it was very, very good workshop. I want to thank to all the speakers for taking their time and preparing this material for today and also to the audience for their engagement and sending their question and we will do our best to, to come with answers to all the questions we receive in the coming days. And yeah, I hope it was useful, um, insightful and also interactive as, as much as interactive it could be in a virtual environment. And uh, yeah, just thank you one more time to everyone and wish you a nice day. Thank you to everyone for assisting. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.